the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry, celebrating 60 years of empirical research, clinical studies, and systematic reviews. For details of our 60th anniversary celebrations, visit www.acamh.org slash jcpp60. Follow us on Twitter with the handle at the JCPP and use the hashtag JCPP60. So, um, Eric initially spoke about the importance of, of the journal and, uh, and the work that we do in terms of clinical translation and how critical that is to our, our aims of uh, what we do as scientists and clinicians. And um, uh, Edmund spoke about the holy grail. That was with impact factors. But here in, in imaging world, and most of neuroscience, I think, the holy grail would be using our biomarkers. In my instance, it would be brain images to diagnose psych psychiatric illness. So MRI scanning was first introduced for clinical use in 1984. Its application to the study of neuropsychiatric disorders soon followed. And I joined the field in 1990 as a postdoctoral fellow at Yale. Since then, the holy grail of imaging research, for me and for most MRI researchers, I would say, has been to use MRI to improve clinical care in the lives of patients, either to help diagnose psychiatric illness or to identify biological subtypes that will aid in predicting the future clinical course of illness or the response to treatment. My assumption then until recently was that finding the holy grail would translate immediately and easily to clinical application and dissemination. I mean, how could it not? If you can diagnose psychiatric illness with imaging, wouldn't that automatically translate to clinical practice? Well, that proved to be a very naive assumption, as the hurdles leading from neuropsychiatric discovery to clinical translation are formidable. And in fact, the discovery marks only the beginnings of a much longer ongoing quest. And in this brief talk, I'd like to give a, an example of a discovery from my laboratory and the hurdles to its clinical application that I hope will be broadly relevant to other neuroscientific discoveries, including you know, uh, SNPs, uh, polygenic scores, uh, and any other neuroscientific bio, uh, biomarker. So let me give you a, a conceptual framework for, for and, and a little bit of historical framework for how this went and, and how we came up with our way of using MRI to diagnose psychiatric illness. So in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, the first MRI studies were really applied to schizophrenia. The aim was to show that it had a biological basis, if you can imagine that in the brain. Um, the, the first studies were looking at overall brain volume. And in fact, many studies showed that on average, schizophrenic people have smaller volumes of their brain. When they tried to use that as a diagnostic marker, it failed miserably. And we'll talk about why that is briefly. Um, here's an, an overall brain. And obviously, you know that it, it's composed of many different brain subregions. There's a lot of variability in each of those subregions that contribute to overall variance of brain size. So if you were to remove an entire gyrus or the entire right frontal lobe, for example, you have enough variance remaining in the rest of the brain and probably compensation for having removed that dysfunctional part of the brain that it would um, hypertrophy and it would um, mask the massive underlying volume deficit that you had so that overall volume still wouldn't be a, an, a, a decent marker. So subsequently, people went to smaller brain regions thinking that that would be the trick. So probably the most studied region would be the amygdala hippocampus here, looking straight on. Here's the top of the head, bottom of the head. Tiny structures about so big in, in the human brain. But those two, obviously, are very structurally and functionally heterogeneous. So the amygdala and cross-section has all these subnuclei that each does a different thing in information processing. And each one of them has a lot of variability. So you remove one of those, and you still have a lot of variability in the overall structure. Similarly, for the hippocampus, lots of different uh, sub-portions of the hippocampus, and, and the same for the thalamus, lots of subnuclei in the thalamus. So going smaller, only going smaller, doesn't buy you out of anything. The, the, the same degrees of sensitivity and specificity were found. And this is. Um, showing you a little bit more what I mean by that. These are actual data from our lab. So here are schizophrenic uh, 
adults here, healthy controls. On the y-axis is overall volume of the hippocampus. The means are shown here, horizontal bars, and the whiskers are the uh, standard errors. And you can see the overlap in overall volume of the hippocampus. Now, this produces poor sensitivity and poor specificity if you're using the overall volume because healthy controls, those who are, have smaller hippocampuses, will often be misclassified as schizophrenic. Schizophrenic people with larger volumes will often be misclassified as controls or healthy. That leads to poor sensitivity, poor specificity. So here's in general what we were trying to do that's quite different than that. We're trying to um, take into account the different portions of the hippocampus that do different things functionally in terms of information processing. So this is the medial, a medial view of the hippocampus. Here's the head, body, and tail. We can take a large sample of, of schizophrenic and healthy people, overlay those hippocampuses one on top of another, and millimeter by millimeter, we can compare the surface indentations or protrusions, or you can think of it as local volumes, in schizophrenic versus healthy controls, and then we color code that. We color code it so that if, if, if you see blue, it means it's smaller in the schizophrenic group, so it's smaller in the head. Red means it's larger, so it's larger in the anterior body. Green means there's not any real significant difference between the two. And then purple, again, means it's massively reduced in size of the tail. So these are the differing portions, functional units, of the hippocampus. And what we tried to do in this algorithm, I, th I think we largely succeeded, is to say, OK, you have a, a person. You want to know, is this schizophrenic or a healthy person? We would um, define their hippocampus. And essentially what our algorithm does is it says, does this person tend to have a small head of the hippocampus, an enlarged anterior body, a sort of normal mid-body, and a drastically reduced tail? So you can think of it like the, the fingerprints on, and the dermal, dermal, dermatomal ridges on your fingers that have um, a, a surface morphology. And we're trying to capture that entire um, morphology in a single glance, and that's what we're doing, and that's what we're asking in our algorithm. We're not asking it only in the hippocampus. We ask it in the amygdala. We ask it in the basal ganglia and thalamus. We ask it at the surface of the brain, and we're saying collectively across all those surfaces in the brain, it, does this person tend to map onto and look like a schizophrenic individual versus others that we have compared them to, okay? So conceptually, that, that's what we're doing and trying to do. And so this is showing more proof of concept at the level of the cortex for different disorders. So here's Tourette syndrome in our data sets. They tend to have, in red, enlarged frontal and parietal lobes bilaterally, uh, reduced temporal lobes, and kind of normal elsewhere. Um, that's very different than, say, ADHD, which has reduced temporal lobes bilaterally, but it reduced um, inferior frontal volumes bilaterally. That, in turn, is very different than these other conditions. So familial depression, we've shown, um, has reduced cortical thickness in the uh, right hemisphere, but not the left. So it's very asymmetric. That's very different than bipolar disorder, which goes the opposite direction, which has cortical thickening bilaterally and symmetrically. So familial depression, bipolar, very, very different, and very different than schizophrenia. So you can think of these as neural fingerprints for families of conditions, and that's what we're trying to capture. I'm going to tell you really briefly, sort of glossing, how we actually achieve that technologically. So first we had to define all these surfaces in, in very, very carefully to um, so you can't just automate this. It has to be very precisely defined. Secondly, and more importantly, we then had to capture that spatial variation. We had to capture the vari that, that neural fingerprint, if you will, um, um, in order to feed it into a classification algorithm. So how we capture this, I would say this is really the key of the, the technology or the algorithm, is we first treated each of these structures. Topologically, they're, they're a sphere, even though they look you know, they're stretched, but essentially they morph to a sphere. And that has an advantage because then we can apply an engineering tool called a spherical wavelet transform. I'm going to show you an example so you don't have to freak out about that. The, the, the spherical wavelet transform has a couple of um, really massive advantages. One is it allows us to capture in a few numbers, a few variables, that complex spatial variation across the entire brain. 
It also has, functions as a data reduction technique. So if you look across all these surfaces, there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of points. That, that, those are too many variables to feed into machine learning algorithms. You don't get stable results. We had to reduce the data, and, and so the, the spherical wavelet transform uh, um, served that purpose for us. This is just showing you proof of, of concept as well. We did a lot of computer simulations to prove that we, we could actually do this. So in normal brains, we introduced deformations. Uh, here's a protrusion. Here's an indentation. We did it in a lot, a lot of brains. We would capture that spatial variation uh, by first uh, warping this and morphing it to the unit sphere here. The red shows the enlargement uh, on the surface that we introduced. Then we used the spherical wavelet transform to reduce the data set. So this is showing you with lots of uh, scaling coefficients or vectors. This is with uh, far fewer and far fewer yet. And you can see that we can still, with very few variables, we can capture that spatial variation very, very efficiently. That then feeds into a machine learning algorithm. So um, we, we did use machine learning. This was hierarchical clustering, machine-based. This is unsupervised learning. So briefly what we did, let's say we took all the schizophrenic brains and all the healthy brains. Um, we threw them into a bucket, and we asked the machine learning algorithm, give us two naturalistic groupings based on all of the neural fingerprints that you're able to, to discern. Just two naturalistic groupings. We did, it just did it automatically and blindly, and then we kind of looked at it to see what we got. Now, it could have classified two groups based on sex or age or socioeconomic status or any other features. We didn't know. It happened to break it down across diagnostic lines, so we would get all schizophrenic and all healthy controls. Just sort of, I mean, it was absolutely stunning, right? So we wanted to do that more rigorously, um, and we did it with a, a split half validation scheme. So for each of these comparisons, schizophrenia versus controls, Tourette's versus controls, Tourette's versus ADHD, all the combinations, um, we threw the brains, well, we randomly sampled half of the brains from each group. We didn't know what they were. We mixed them up, put them into a bucket, generated the classification. So now we have a classification scheme developed in half the data set. And then the other half, we bring in a brain one at a time, completely blindly and automatically, and said, how does the classification perform? Does it take the schizophrenic brains and put them with the schizophrenic bucket and controls and so forth? And it turns out it did it incredibly well. Now, the split half uh, scheme and, and tech, uh, technique has massive advantages because we could do that many times. So we're generating not just a single al algorithm, we could generate 10 or 50 or 100 different algorithms and see how each one performed. And the fascinating thing is each time we generate an algorithm, it pulled out the same features of the brain that were uh, across algorithms that were we're performing the classification. So that says that the algorithm is very, very robust with respect to which brains are the, it's learning on. Okay, so that was really critical. Okay, so here's how it performed. So ADHD versus healthy controls. Not all regions entered in and were informed, but cortex, hippocampus, amygdala, basal ganglia were. So we had about 94% sensitivity, 90% specificity. Tourette's versus healthy. You can see the informative regions, 95% uh, sensitive, 79% specific. So it was getting it wrong in some of the controls. Schizophrenia and healthy, you see it, 93 and 95. Bipolar and healthy, 196 specificity. So those are all with healthy controls. You can say, yeah, well, that's simple. How about diagnostic groups of clinical relevance? So bipolar and schizophrenia, that can be hard clinically to discern. And here we got 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity. Now, it's performing even better than in controls because the brain abnormalities are going in very different opposite directions. They're thicker in uh, bipolar and reduced in schizophrenia. Tourette's versus ADHD, nearly perfect. I, this is a, a little bit of a complex slide. These are the dendrograms that uh, are, the, are the result of the machine classifications. Individual subjects on the x-axis, uh, classification metric on the, on the y. I want to 
emphasize a couple things. You can see how, how it performs some of these classifications and with essentially no overlap between schizophrenia and bipolar. But here's the, the, the really important thing, I think, is you have, see a lot of evidence for biological subgroups within each of these disorders. So it offers the prospect and promise of being able to um, provide biologically, morphologically defined subgroups of these disorders that we can then map and find what are the regions that are, are producing that. And it suggests that within these DSM classifications, yes, there's biological heterogeneity, but there's an overall family resemblance in these conditions that allow the, the, the classification to work. That's really critical, um, I think. So um, after that, so we, we had that kind of worked out by 2011 or so. And it took about a year to get the backing of the university to say, yeah, we're, we're going to back this and financially push the, um, the patent and the FDA approval and so forth. They're very reluctant to, to fund algorithms, by the way. They want hardware. They want genes. They want stuff that you can hang on to. Algorithms they don't like too much. But they finally agreed. Patenting took us six years. There are reasons why. So FDA doesn't like to approve algorithms either. Here they said, yeah, well, you know, people have used the, the spherical wavelet transform. They've used MRI. They've used machine learning. And that's like taking the wires and capacitors and resistance, uh, resistors and throwing them together and getting a ham radio. And, um, and they were saying that's inevitable. Someone would have done it. It's, it's prior art. So we finally had convinced them. Uh, we had to become more and more specific about the configuration of the radio that we were building. Took us about six years and more than 50 deliveries of pitch decks to, to, con to get um, a CEO and investors, ultimately, who would support this and push it to the next level, which I'll describe briefly. We went to the FDA and said, actually, there was a real question. Do we need FDA approval for this? We never intended as a standalone device. It would be an aid to clinicians. And you know, was it, did it require FDA approval? It wasn't so clear, um, but ultimately, yes, we do. And the FDA regards it as so disruptive, there's nothing like it out there that now um, it has to go through a de novo pathway, which means the, the standards for, for proving that this works are very, very high. So that required us, in turn, to seek $5 million in funding, which we just got last month. Um, we have to bring the software coding up to industry standards, and then about $4 million to conduct a prospective trial in newly um, presenting patients to see if this works in them. And this is only for one indication. It'll be for ADHD versus controls. You can multiply all this by each of the other indications. So that's really the bottom line. I just wanted to point out that you know, you think it's going to be easy. You come up with something that you think is really fantastic, and, it, and this is uh, um, seven years since we had the answer, what we think is an answer, an answer, not the answer, and it's at least another three or four or five years before we would get FDA approval, and then you have to bring it to market. So it's a daunting task, I mean, absolutely daunting, and because of that, the quest just like Monty Python will continue. Thank you very much. To be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health, visit www.acamh.org.